silence have passed, and God works in history to bring about the fulfillment of prophecy. But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. It is love that comes to Bethlehem at the right time to fulfill God's purpose. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. The love of Joseph, a descendant of David, for his wife Mary. The love of Mary for her husband Joseph. The love of both for the son that God proclaimed would save his people from their sins. Love brought them to Bethlehem at the right time. A newborn baby is born in Bethlehem. The cry that baby sounds out as a declaration of hope, an announcement of love, and a trumpet of victory. God has come to live among his creation and make a way for humankind to have peace with God. Love came to earth to you. Are you ready? Are you prepared? God's love has come to you. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his only son. 
so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. I want to thank uh, Don Diana for doing that. And Diana was so worried she couldn't get the lighter right, but she did so well. And I hope you, uh, you know, listen and think about, you know, what it means as we come. And we are preparing. I, I don't know about you, but most of us uh, say, my house, we're, we're still preparing. That is, we've almost got everything out of the boxes and that we use to decorate. And, uh, there's also that preparation of, uh, you know, trying to find gifts. Is anybody having a hard time finding gifts that you really you know, kind of... The other part is we have to get them early because we don't know how the mail is going to be about getting them to it. So, of course, you, you can, you know, if you didn't get one, I bet you they found it in a ravine in Alabama. Oh. So FedEx dumped about 400... Uh, boxes there. Uh, just kidding. I really want us though to think about preparation and how we prepare our hearts and our souls for Christmas and what it means for us. It's a lot when we think about it. It has meaning more than the busyness of the season. So as we come together, as we light this, the candles of the Advent wreath, again, the preparation as we think about Jesus as he came as a baby. Also think and prepare your hearts about Jesus who will come again one day as well. There are uh, announcements in our bulletin. You have them there. You can see different things that are taking place. Those of you on Stewardship Finance Committee, if we can meet... Uh, uh, did I put that in? Yeah. On uh, Thursday at 6. I think I said Monday. Did Larry? Larry, didn't I? You told me Monday. I told you Monday. I, I wanted to do it, and I just put the... I just... Let's try and meet tomorrow. <laughs> and so that should be the... The 6th. Uh, All right. At 6 o'clock. So 12, 6, and 6 for just stewardship. We just need to go over a few things and we'll be there. See the other uh, happenings that are going. I mean, to encourage you to be here next Sunday when, as a church, we will uh, celebrate and have a Christmas meal together, fellowship meal that will be provided. And uh, you don't have to bring anything so just except yourself. If you want to, uh, if you, uh, want to invite somebody, that's okay. All right, that would be that would be fine, you know. That we also have a, a pretty good list started for our Christmas baskets, and that are, that is going on. Also, I know that you have uh, some of you have already done so. Let me also encourage you to uh, look and see what you uh, God wants you to give towards our Lighting Moon Christmas offering. That's for international missions for the Southern Baptist Convention, and I pray and trust you will give that. Also. Uh, on December 18th at 11 o'clock at Shelbyville Central High School, it's the Defenders of Freedom and Liberty. It's the Wreaths Across America program. And uh, if you uh, want to help in that way, uh, see Tim, just, he can let you know some specifics. But it's a, it is a wonderful thing that, that we do. Uh, and it is done to honor uh, those who have given uh, and served their country, Greece across America, so uh, that will be the 18th in uh, Shelfville Central High. Last week I asked you to prepare your hearts. I hope that you were able to take away at least one thing from last Sunday's service that uh, you were able to, to use that this week. And that again is my prayer that as we look at, at this, as we finish up uh, our uh, series sermon on the Beatitudes, that we will have found something that God touched our heart and our life with from his word <laughs> and that we've been obedient to follow him and to use it in our lives because it will be good for us uh, to do that. As we continue in our time of, of worship, uh, join with me if you would in, in prayer.
Father, this is the day that you've made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us rejoice because we are here in church with our church family. Let us rejoice because you are with us. And let us rejoice because you loved us and gave your son for us. That in believing in him, we might have life eternal. May we continue to open ourselves up to what this season is all about. What the manger means to those of us who follow you. And where it led on a life of perfection by your son. Lived in obedience to you, Father. All the way to the cross. And we thank you and praise you and rejoice in the empty tomb. The resurrection. We rejoice that Jesus will come again. Help us to be ready. We also turn our attention to our family members, our brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever they might be, but especially those who are part of this church family. For those who are sick, bring healing. For those who are weak, Bring strength for those who are tired. Give them rest. We commit this time to you. May it bring honor to your name. In Jesus' name. practice at 5.05 p.m. tonight, and we'll do that if we can get at least six people to commit to be here. Six people. One, two, three, four. All right, no choir practice for lack of a choir <laughs> for them. <laughs> Would you stand with the choir and me as we sing number 245, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, 245.
will receive an offering this morning. Would you remain standing as Brother Tim Estes has the blessing on the offering? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to give you the praise, Father, for being the Almighty living God. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've bestowed upon this church, this congregation. Lord, we ask that you be with anyone that couldn't be here this morning for whatever reason. Lord, that you just be with them and bless them and bring them back. And Father, I ask that you bless this offering as we take it and give us the wisdom to do what you have us do to uphold the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Turn to number 277, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We may leave here looking and sounding like Methodists. Uh, we're getting a double dose of Charles Wesley. <laughs> he wrote that opening chorus, and he also wrote this song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the Herald Angels Sing
you know, Wesley and the hymns that he wrote, many of them, when you look at the words of the hymns, there is so much good theology. And uh, because of that good theology, uh, those who couldn't read often though, would know things because of the words of songs that they were able to sing. So that's a, a good thing for us. I do uh, want to say uh, it's good to see each and every one of you. It's good to see Dina here. And it's good to see you. You stepped in. Um, I met her this week and at a gas station. And so, uh, just something that, uh, you know, God said, do. Welcome. So I did. So she said, where's your church? I said, here's my car. So I did her name, Katie, right? Yes. Katie, so good to have you with us, Katie. So good to have you with us. This is, uh, this is the people of Harmony Baptist Church. And they're good folks. They're yeah. good folks. All right. Oh, I knew that's where I was going after that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, God bless you. All right. Let's uh, take our Bibles and open to uh, Matthew chapter 5. We are ending. This will be, and I know none of you said thank God. I know you didn't say that. The last sermon on the Beatitudes until God leads me back to it, right? Okay. But we've been looking at these uh, for a long time, and, and even though we're in the Christmas season, I think it was appropriate, I felt, to, do, to finish and to get through them. And uh, so we are at the very end. We begin in verse 10, and as we look at these uh, together uh, through verse 12, it uh, tells us, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And last week we took a look at this, what did Jesus mean, and we saw that persecution was part and parcel, if you will, of God's people in Scripture, in the Bible. Uh, being persecuted was not unusual, and uh, we found that uh, to be so, and that was the pattern of persecution, is when you stood for God, there is a world that is hostile to God, and therefore is hostile to you. We saw that uh, the forms of persecution could be of the hand, that is physical violence or persecution, and of the tongue those people who revile you, who say things about you because you belong to Jesus. And that was persecution. We saw, too, that the results of the persecution had a sanctifying effect on the church. We have seen that when persecution arises among uh, the people of God in the world, that the people of God stand and that they, uh, that they make their righteousness known, that is, the righteousness of God that is theirs, and they, they seem to live holier lives. Does that make sense? Because sometimes without persecution, without those things that might uh, have people making us stand, we get uh, lethargic in our faith. It's just, you know, uh, it's just, oh well, it's part of our lives. But is it a part of our lives? You know what I mean by that? And at the end of last week, we began to look at the outcome of persecution because Jesus says, blessed are you. So there is a great blessing when you are persecuted. That sure doesn't sound like that's a great thing, is it? And yet, it is. These are the words of Christ. And what he's really saying, remember, as we look at the Beatitudes, the whole, uh, from chapter, I mean, from verse uh, uh, three on down, we see that he's saying, these are the marks of those who follow me. These are the characteristics of those who claim to be and are the children of God and the followers of Jesus Christ. And so we want to be blessed, don't we? Don't you want to be blessed? Amen. And so he says to us, there is great blessing 
when you are persecuted or when you suffer for my name's sake. And there's a fellowship with Christ found in suffering that is greater than you will find anywhere else. And we pointed to the, and ended last week with the, the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Or as one of the person I know says, Abednego. He likes to say it that way. I always remembered it, to, uh, and it's, you know, how do you, it's Abednego. So, you know, uh, that's kind of as a kid that helped to help me kind of remember that. But when they were thrown into the fire by Nebuchadnezzar, and what did they find in the midst of the suffering of that fire? What did they find? Who was there with them? Yeah. The king says, didn't we throw three guys in there? Yes, O king. Well, why are there four? And the fourth looks like the son of man or son of God. Somebody asked me last week, how, how did Nebuchadnezzar recognize someone who looked like a, a, a son of God? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> For sure. But you know, in their way, they would have made idols and thought and had concepts of who would be a son of God. And the Greeks had, you know, Hercules and other, you know. So to him, though, what he saw was somebody who was different than the other three, but it was a, it was, you know, he was walking upright and was there with them and, and all this. And so we find in that suffering, we find that God is there and maybe in a way that we hadn't ever seen him before. I bet each and every one of you can think of times within your own lives where there has been what we would call suffering and where you hopefully felt closer to God in that. Because you recognize that he was there with you. And, you know, there are always the testimonies of others who, in the midst of what they have done, in the midst of what they have felt, they have felt the presence of God with them. Paul and Silas and Philippian jail. They sang praises. Many of you know of, of the name of John Bunyan. He wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And you may or may not know that he was imprisoned for 12 years in Bedford, England because he preached the gospel. At that time, Queen Elizabeth I basically said, everybody has to be part of the Church of England. And if you're not a part of the Church of England, you can't preach outdoor preaching. You can't preach. So Methodists, or not Methodists, they weren't around yet. <laughs> Baptist and Congregational folks and others, uh, preachers who were preaching either had to stop preaching or they got thrown into jail. And, uh, you know, Bunyan said that uh, Jesus Christ was never more real to me uh, than now, that is being in jail. In jail. Here I have seen and felt him indeed. And uh, he prom promised the blessings in the face of mockery and ridicule and slander and persecution. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Think about that. When you suffer... The spirit of God's glory and of God rests upon you when we suffer for his name's sake. So there's great blessing and there's also great reward. That sounds kind of funny too, doesn't it? When, hey, I'm going to persecute you. And Jesus says, it's okay, you're going to get a reward. You're going to get a reward. And it's not like, you know, uh, a parent who says to a child, uh, you know, I've got I've to gotta give you this discipline. I'll give you something afterwards. I always hate that when I heard a parent say that, you know. He said such a hard time. We go out and buy him a video game. Oh. <laughs> I heard it. Not in my own home, okay? They will testify. But I did. Oh, he's, he's had such a hard time. And, and, and a lot of it was of his, his own making, but the, the, the mama old. I've got to do this for him. I don't want to tell you how uh, he's had a rough time growing up, but uh, that's, that is judgmental. 
I'm sorry. I should. But Jesus says to us, there is a great reward. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And there are verses in Scripture that seem to tell us that there will be rewards for what takes place here on earth in the lives of those who follow Jesus. Matthew 10, 42, Jesus says, Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water in my name, and that means because I'm a disciple, or your disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. And what does that mean? If there's a reward for this act, giving a cup of water in the name of Jesus Christ, it must mean that there's something gained by doing it uh, that would not have been gained if you didn't do it. Jesus then told a parable in which servants who were trusted with responsibility were rewarded. And their reward was based on their stewardship. And one was given authority over ten cities. And one was given authority over five cities. And another was given, uh, or in that story, it is a parable, the authority that they were given and what it's teaching this. The rewards are graciously given by God to his redeemed people. And that rewards are different, not in kind, but in degree. One got five cities. One had responsibility over ten cities. So the question is, do some have a greater reward in heaven? Will we not all be the same in heaven? Well, Jesus says to us that we are to lay up treasure in heaven. Isn't that so? Amen. And yet many people and many of his followers do not. I guess they choose to have more here and less there. And they could choose to have more there and less here. Either way, what I do here makes a difference to what I have there, right? And yet that's hard. It really is. How do we say to somebody, you're going to get your reward in heaven? Well, I want it now. Well, but you're going, don't worry about it. I also say this too, that there are those who do things that they don't seem to get the judgment in this life. And we have to say to God, you judge what comes after. I know, but I just really wish they did. Again, that's being judgmental, that's not being right. Well, let God decide that, and God does decide these things. He decides about the reward. And in the eighth beatitude, he says, when you're persecuted, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. He seems to be saying that you should have some joy because something will be yours on account of your suffering that would, would not have otherwise been yours. It's just hard to grab onto that, isn't it? Especially when we know that we are doing what is right. And we get persecuted for it. We talked about that a, a little bit uh, and looked in, in Peter, 1 Peter 2 about that. We let the judge of all judge. And the example he gives is that of Jesus Christ. Well, there are different degrees of happiness and glory in heaven. We will all be happy in heaven. Don't worry about that. You will all be happy. I guess you might want to think of it this way when we come to that. Think of it, you of all this as little pots. Use your imagination. You are a little pot, and you all will be cast into the ocean of happiness. And all the pots, they'll be full. But some of them will be bigger than others. And the thing is, we won't look at somebody and say, I wish I was that pot. You will be happy and full because of the pot that you are that God has given you to be. Now, God doesn't say we earn rewards in heaven like air miles on a credit card, okay? But the Bible speaks of reward in heaven. 
and it does speak of those who are persecuted, that their reward will be great. Well, what happens if I'm not being persecuted? What happens if you're not being persecuted? I will say this, and you, I think, understand that, that we here in America have been very blessed in so many ways, that we have not encountered the same persecution that our brothers and sisters in Christ have encountered throughout the world. And in fact, most Christians who have lived in, throughout history have been persecuted for their belief. And we have found some freedom in this country from that, haven't we? We need to be thanking God about that. You know, suffering is not simply to be endured because something will come out of it that is greater and if it had never happened. What do you do when you're not being persecuted? Well, I have five answers here, things that we can do, uh, and we'll go through them pretty quickly at this point. Let me say this, though, uh, to begin with. We need to be thankful. Thankful for the blessings of peace and freedom. We are not to wish for persecution. We're not to seek it. We don't go out there and, and say, you know what, I want like reward in heaven, so I'm going to be as obnoxious as I can so I get people to, to come at me because of my Christianity. And then I can say, oh, you see, you see, you see how oh, God loves me. I'm being persecuted for his sake. It's called a martyr complex. That wasn't my stomach. I, 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 I promise. I don't know. All right. We all had a good laugh. Okay. But we are to be thankful for the gift of freedom, and we're to do everything in our power to protect it, and even to be praying, really, that we have peace. Paul said to Timothy, I urge that supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. Why? That we may lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. A peaceful and quiet life is something to pray for and something to be thankful for. So we don't need to cultivate persecution like we cultivated the others of the Beatitudes and characteristics of that. But we are to pray that we have peace and freedom and to thank God for it if we don't have persecution. Uh, Forrester, just switch me to this mic. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll make sure that that's, it's not that, or it's not the, the lavalier. It's not my stomach, see, I told you. But the way my lavalier is on the sweater, it might have been when I moved that it, it was catching that, so there, all right. Where were we? Can you tell me? Pray for peace. <laughs> Tim thought we were on number four. No, we're on number one. We're still on number one. Just finishing it. <laughs> we do. We do. We need to be thankful for the peace and freedom that we have, the liberty that we have in this country to be able to, to freely worship and not to suffer the persecutions that we might have if we lived somewhere else. Which brings me to number two, is we need to remember those who are persecuted. By the way, this is very biblical. The writer of Hebrews in, in Hebrews 13, 3 says, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. And those who are mistreated as you always are in the body. The book of Hebrews gives us a role of honor as suffering heroes of the Old Testament. The Hebrew Christians who received the letter and had their goods confiscated, they were under some persecution. And so he says to them, he writes to them, don't stop meeting together. And he's not, he's really telling them, don't forsake getting together. Don't forget those who might be in prison because of their faith. Why? 
Because when you come together, you encourage one another. But we are to remember those who are persecuted, those who are in prison. There's a, a well, he's a, a man, he's a couple years older than, than I am, but uh, I grew up and we were in the same church, same youth group. He was a, he was a grade, he was a year ahead of me in, in uh, school. So that is not me, guy. And he uh, made some poor decisions in his life, and he is uh, serving, I think it's 25 years in prison in California. And he's come to mind a few times because there are a couple things that he did in his life as a young person that had an influence on me, I mean a good influence, some things that he did, some things that he said. So recently I, I got his address from another one of his family members that I had run into. The thing is I haven't quite followed through with writing him a letter yet. Every, I get reminded about it and then I'm not at home to do it and I forget when I get home I forget to write the letter. But I need to remember that he is God's child. And so, you ask me next week if I wrote the letter, okay? My purpose is to write it this week. To remember him, to pray for him. You know, in some countries when a, a policeman walks into a church service, he's there to arrest the pastor or others or stop it. If we have a policeman in ours, it's probably because he's there to protect us. Remember those who are in prison and mistreated. You are the members of one body. They are part of our family. We need to remember them. What do we do when you're, we're not being persecuted? Number three, make sure you're doing what is right. Make sure you're doing what is right. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I guess if you're not being persecuted, you might ask yourself, am I living a righteous life? That's a good thing to ask yourself. If there's not much persecution, could it be that I'm not really living in such a way that my life is reflective of the righteousness of God in me? Now, all of us could live a better life, right? And yet, just because we could, doesn't mean that we do. And we need to look at what God is doing in, in us, and we need to say, are we living rightly? In the very next verses in Matthew chapter 5, when he finishes with that, about being persecuted, he says to his disciples, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You don't hide yourselves. The light isn't hidden. It's set where people can see it. They don't put a light and light it and put it under a basket. No. They light it so they will bring light to the house so people can see. So he says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Check your life. 
And it doesn't mean just because you live a life of righteousness that when you're not being persecuted that you've got to do more and be more. You, you understand? But you need to be light. And you need to be soft. Rebecca Manley Pimper wrote a book a long time ago. I was in college when it came out. and She came to speak at our college and it's called Out of the Salt Shaker. Kind of interesting title, Out of the Salt Shaker. But what she was saying is we are the salt of the earth as, as God has called us to be. But if we stay in the salt shaker, we're no good. So get out of the salt shaker. She's written a a, uh, a sequel to that, if you will, in the last couple of years called Stay Salt. Stay Salt. P-I-P-P-E-R-T is her last name, and I would recommend both books to you if you would want to read something about how you can be salt in the world. The challenge for all of us is to live an authentic Christian life before unbelieving and sometimes a hostile world. But we do so because Christ has called us to do that. Number four, persevere in the face of difficulty and opposition. One of the easiest ways to avoid pain, persecution, and trouble and opposition is to move whenever it happens. Some Christians remain spiritual infants because they form the habit of always taking the easier path when tough times come. One of the things about our culture is that we live in a world of choice. I mean, we do, don't we? I mean, there are all kinds of, which one, I, which one do I get? Especially when my wife might send me to the store for, like, you know, some face cream or something. I don't know what she uses. Look at all these. What do you need? We'll get the one in the blue bottle. They all have blue! You know how it can be. We, I mean, we live in choices. I mean, don't even get me started on the number of you know, choices of, of toothpaste out there. I mean, what are you going to do? But you know what? Since we have choice, we have choice of doctors, we have choice of churches, we have choice of schools. The problem about living in a choice culture is that if you experience difficulty in a place, you easily move to another. If things get difficult in my job, I can quit and find another. And, these are cultures geared to comfort and convenience. It's easy to form the habit of always choosing the easiest path. I've got to do what's best for me and my family, and that is a good thing. I'm not saying it isn't. But sometimes the easiest way is not what God wants you to do, even for you and your family. Especially for Christians today when we take a look at school. I'm not going to get into it, okay? But we all know some of the things that are happening in our schools and in the education of our children. And I, because I lived it and my dad was a public school teacher and others in my family are public school teachers, I've always said I want my kids to be in public school. Why? So that they can be a light in a public school system. So they can be salt in a public school system. So they can see uh, to others and let them know that Jesus Christ makes a difference in their life. But the world is really coming apart within our schools, and it's hard for our children to be in there. And so Christian families many times have gone to either trying to find a Christian school that will teach the things of Christ, or even doing homeschool. Nothing wrong with that. But we need to persevere in the face of difficulty and opposition. Because what is easiest for me and my family isn't always what is best for me and my family. How do you determine that? How do you know when you should hang in there because you're being persecuted? Or you should escape the persecution? It's not always an easy task to understand. I want to share again a little bit about uh, John Bunyan and his life. He was, as I said, arrested for preaching in an open air service when he wasn't supposed to. And he spent 12 years in prison away from his family, and especially he had, and his nine children. And one of his children, a daughter, was blind, and he was always concerned about her. 
And after he was in jail, he wrote a book called Seasonable Counsels or Advice to Sufferers. And what he was basically saying is, you know, <laughs> he said, you know, when I got thrown into jail, I could have given a bond to get out. But the judge said to those who helped put up that bond to get him out, you know that if he gets out and he disobeys the law, you will lose the money that you put up for him. He said, so he lost those people who were going to give him the bond. Because he said to the judge, and the judge asked him, are you going to keep preaching? He said, judge, if you let me go today, I will preach tomorrow. Amen. And so he landed in prison. When he wrote about this, one of the verses that he had in mind was this that Jesus said to his disciples. When you look at Matthew chapter 10, it is the commissioning of the twelve. And he tells them about what is going to happen and things that could happen while they went out on their own. He says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And he didn't say, So let the wolves tear you apart. You know, that's what wolves do, don't you? But he said, You're going as sheep in the midst of wolves, so... Be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. So Bunyan, as he looked about this and thought about this, he said, man is not bound by the law of the Lord to put himself into the mouth of his enemy. Christ withdrew himself. Paul escaped the governor's hands by being let down in a basket over the wall of the city. And Christ, again in chapter 10 of Matthew, said, if they persecute you in one city, flee to another. And he showed of others in the Bible who had to flee, or as Bunyan would say, to fly. He says, you must do what is in your heart. If it's in your heart to fly or to flee, fly. If it's in your heart to stand, then stand. But do it knowing that you are doing what is right and true is what God would want you to do. See, there were times when Moses fled, but Moses also stood. There were times when David fled, and there were times when David stood. Jeremiah fled, and Jeremiah stood. Quiet Christ withdrew himself, and Christ stood. Paul fled, and Paul stood. You see, you need to know what your own strength is. And understand, can I handle what is coming? You have the strength for this persecution. And you need to do what God is telling you to do. It says, if you have to flee, don't flee out of fear. But flee in ordinance of God, opening a door for escape, which doors open by God's providence, and, it, and the escape is countenance by God. Sometimes it is God saying that we need to be out of persecution rather than to keep ourselves in it. God is not a God of confusion, is he? And when you ask God, God, show me what I need to do. He will show you what you need to do. Katie, do you mind if I share our little encounter? No, I don't mind. Okay. I didn't know she was coming for sure, so I couldn't ask her permission, so I might have shared it even if she wasn't here, but I can ask permission. <laughs> Beth needed me to get gas in her car. She can't drive because of her. So I, I, okay, I got home Wednesday night. I said, okay, I, I'll go and take her car. And I went to the, I was going to go to a further gas station, but I decided to go to the gas station. Day. It was, I mean, you know, it was about two cents more. You know, I could have saved two cents. That's ago. right. <laughs> so I went to, I said, here it is, I'll just go in here. And then I pulled in. I, her gas tank's on a different side than my gas tank. So as I pulled in, I realized I hadn't pulled in exactly the way I needed to to get gas and, on that side. And so I saw this red car pull in, uh, and we were the only two that pulled in to begin with. Katie was in that car, I didn't know. So I pulled in, and I'm next to her, but as I do, I see her walk inside. And I've been hearing about, as Christians, maybe this is a good time for us to do things for others. You know, like pay for the people behind us in line. That's one of the easiest ways to do something and just to say, you know, Jesus loves you. 
And I'm like, oh, ah, you know. Yeah. So I'm filling up my, and I, you know, she gets out of whoever, well, she gets out of here before I'm done. Well, I guess not. <laughs> well, I finished before she did, and I came around the the, the tanks, the, the gas tanks there, and I said, I said, how much are you putting in? And she told me how much she's putting in. Well, I knew, you know, I said, well, let me top top it off for you. He said, no. I said, yeah, let me do. <laughs> so, you know, I did what God asked me to do. And then she told me a little bit of her story. How that she's been in rehab and has gotten there. How she's taking parenting classes so she can get her kids back. Now she's, and one of the first things she said though was, man, God is doing so many wonderful things. Okay. And I don't tell you to say, you know, look what Daryl has done, but I say that to say there are opportunities for us. We might get persecuted for it, but it's best to be obedient and to listen. What God says to do, he'll confirm in you. He's not a God of confusion. If he puts you in a place where you suffer for his name's sake, and he says for you to stay, then stay. Great is your reward in heaven. If you are put in a place of persecution and you just can't take it, and you know that you can't, or your family cannot, I know of a minister who uh, was asked to leave his church when there's nothing going on. I mean, he's just like, oh, we don't need you anymore. And he could have said, okay. And he could have gotten on the phone and called up all kinds of people and said, hey, guess what? I'm starting a new church. Want to come with me? And he could have divided that church. But he saw in that, that that was not the best course. And he asked God, God, what do I need to do? And God said, I'll take care of it. We need, we need to persevere. Sometimes God says stand, and sometimes God says fly. And he'll let you know which. Amen. What do you do when you're not being persecuted? You stretch yourself in costly obedience to Christ, number five. This is probably the most practical and of the five that I've given you to do. There really is more than one way to live a costly life. Persecution imposes costs from the outside. But if God allows us the blessing of living with unusual peace and freedom, then we can use that freedom to choose a live, to live a costly life. That is, when someone is in need and you have it, you can share it with them. We can choose the path of costly obedience. Even Jesus said this, no one takes about his own life, no one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Don't you want to say about your own life that you chose to lay it down as a living sacrifice for him? That whatever the cost, you know that God will take care of you. Jesus gave everything for you. Shouldn't some of what you give cost you as you give it back to him? I want to be a, a person who follows Christ and I stretch myself out and that there may be costly obedience to that. I want us to be a church that that looks at itself and says, God, what can we do 
What can maybe we even sacrifice as God's church to do what is right in your eyes to help somebody else? We have a van that we're not using really. We're talking about selling it or even giving it away wherever we can and whatever we do. Sure, it'd be great. I mean, used vans are getting out of cars. I mean, great right now, right? But maybe God wants us to find somebody who needs it. We have some extra sound equipment. And we're looking to be giving it away to a new church start. It's starting in calendars, has started in calendars. And that's okay. You have an opportunity to help our international missionaries. Maybe you thought, I'll give this much. But maybe God's telling you to give a little bit more. So it really doesn't cost you that much to give more. Or maybe it does. Whatever it is that God is asking you to do to be obedient, stretch yourself out. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because moth doesn't get to it, rust doesn't get to it. Great is your reward. Pastor Nick Joseph Parker, he spoke about the disciple Thomas, who we all know as Doubting Thomas, right? He wrote something over 100 years ago about uh, Thomas's faith at the resurrection of Jesus. He, in, Thomas in scripture said, unless I see the prints of the nails in his hands, I will not believe. And Parker said this over a hundred years ago of Christ. He said, the unbelieving world is saying about the church today, unless I see in your <coughs> hands the prints of, uh, the prints of the nails, I will not believe. You see, we are God's hands. And people need to know that we belong to him. And they need to know that we are willing to be persecuted for his name's sake. And when that happens, we know and understand that we are blessed. We are blessed. I've said the last two weeks that I wanted you, as we began to listen to all of this, that we would open our hearts to listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us, even if it's one thing. Even if it's one thing that I, nothing that I said did it, but the Spirit of God came into your heart and said, this is what I want you to hear from me today. Because I know it's not always what comes from my lips or even what comes from the scripture that I point you to. It might come from another scripture that God has... It's leading to you, or leading you to. It might be a thought, a word that is said that brings a thought in your mind about something else that God's been working on you to do, to be obedient about. I don't know, but God does. And you do. You know what God has been working in your heart about. Whether he began today or whether he began a long time ago. There's something that he's telling you to be obedient about. And you haven't done it. <coughs> so I ask you to be obedient to him. If you know God is your Lord and Savior, then you've surrendered to him and you've said, You are Lord. You are my master. And I give myself to you. Everybody do me a favor. This is what my choir your teacher always used to say to us in junior high school. Sit up straight, put your feet flat on the floor, hold up your head, then we'd sing, but I'm not going to have you sing. <laughs> what I want you to do is I want to take your hands, and I want you, to, whatever's in it, get it out. I want you to take your hands, and I want you to hold them out like this, as you can. And I want this to symbolize for you giving yourself to God. 
And the way that you give yourself to God is to open yourself to Him. Not hold on to anything, but open yourself to Him. But now, I want you to lift your hands and do this. Turn them out as you can. This is the universal sign of surrender. We surrender ourselves to our Lord. Now, if you can, raise them a little bit higher. Now you're praising God and you're in a Pentecostal church. <laughs> we praise God. We lift our hands in praise for who he is and what he's doing and has done for us. Bow your hands with me. Father, our hearts are open to you. Whatever it is that we are to do, let us do it. If you ask for us to share that this morning, in a word of testimony or, a, or even asking for prayer, then so be it. But let us be encouragers because that is what we have done. We've gathered here together today to encourage one another until you come. We've gathered here today to get our marching orders for the week to live for you. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we come back again Sunday to gather in your presence with your people at Harmony Baptist Church. So stir in our hearts, willing and surrendered lives, and let us follow. With all our strength, with all our mind, with all our bodies, with all our souls. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.